Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I'm very happy to welcome you to this panel with some very distinguished speakers on governing the future and uh, related to the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think there are these two critical words in that governing and future. And I hope that uh, a fair bit of our discussion will also be related to governance. The key message of the Sustainable Development Goals clearly is to leave no one behind. And if we translate that into health terms and into good health for all, which is what SDG 3 talks about, to achieve better health and well-being for all ages, then it's very clear, first clear message that health is a matter of justice. It's a matter of justice within each country, but it is also a matter of global justice. And uh, I believe that is an issue we need to highlight repeatedly. We had a first attempt to address these issues of health inequities through the Millennium Development Goals, but we saw what we missed. We missed the issues of governance, of equity, of human rights. The Millennium Development Goals took us forward on a first path with many very innovative, very many important technical solutions and governance solutions. Some of our new institutions in global health, just think of the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, were created in the context of aiming to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. So already there, there was a move, an impact of saying, how do we need to organize ourselves if we want to reach measurable goals? Now, with the Sustainable Development Goals, at first there was a bit of a disappointment with some people, and they said, what, 17 goals, only one on health? Isn't health the basis of everything? But that's actually the answer, and some of you might know that picture that WHO produced with health uh, in the center and all other goals uh, circled around it. And that, in a sense, is the message that health is the outcome of all other goals, but also health is an input to all other goals. And that is really our challenge also as health professionals to be able to address that. How do we work with others? How do we give that input to other sectors? But also, how do we make other sectors understand in terms of health in all policies, but again, as this notion of governance, how to address our health concerns? And in this uh, area, one of my favorite examples is that, for me, actually, the most important health goal of the Sustainable Development Goals is Goal 12, which is all about sustainable production and consumption, and one of the core goals that actually will define our future. The goals were produced in an enormously participatory process of member states, of the voice of the South, of the voice of citizens, NGOs, and civil society from all around the world, from private sector actors, and in that sense already, they are different from the SDGs. But despite that enormous participation, we see now that there are still some things that we are grappling with, and these are issues that I hope to, in particular, take up uh, with the distinguished panel. One is what you could call the new vulnerabilities. We have the increase of war, we have increasing people on the move, uh, migration, refugee movements, that in that way, with that focus, are not represented uh, in uh, the goals, and also, perhaps despite having a goal on inequality and one on poverty, this notion of focusing in terms of justice on neglected people. Neglected people that are also often lost in the aggregate figures that, uh, that we work with. The second is the new political context. I still believe that when the SDGs were formulated, we had more of a feeling of optimism than sometimes we have today. 
because we do see that there are countries challenging multilateralism, there are countries uh, that uh, challenge uh, globalization, connectivity and open borders, there is an increasing xenophobia and racism around the world, at least it is becoming more visible and more forthright than it used to be. And we have to deal with this new political context in terms of our SDG work. And then, of course, we have incredibly strong commercial drivers, the global food industry, the uh, sugary drinks industry, again rising from the ashes nearly, the tobacco industry with new onslaughts. And these commercial drivers uh, also need to be addressed in this context. So we do need constant accountability as we move forward with the goals, and one of our speakers will be referring to that. But we also need to look at the complexity and the synergy, the systems and the governance that go with the goals, and the science and innovation that go with the goals. And if we want to have two very clear foci, which uh, I would call the two Ps, uh, that would be to really think about the political choices that must be made and how they are made and how we can guarantee the focus on people and partnerships and participation. So those are issues that we hope to uh, cover in the panel. Let me just let you know straight away who's sitting here and who is joining us. First of all, we have Nancy Fullman from the University of Washington from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. She will share with us some of the data the Institute has uh, recently shared with the world on uh, the progress on the health SDGs. We then uh, have with us Dr. Machido Rebecca Moeti, the, director, the regional director of the WHO Regional Office for Africa. We have with us Justin McCarty from Pfizer, who heads the Global Policy and International Public Affairs. And we have El Hajassi with us, the Secretary General of the International Federation of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. And you will see through that composition that some of the issues that I just touched upon are reflected by membership uh, in the panel. So what we will start is uh, with a short presentation by Nancy who will give us just a glimpse of the very, very detailed uh, analyses they have conducted on how countries are progressing on SDG 3, particularly in view of leaving no one behind. So the floor is yours, Nancy, please. All right. Thank you, Alona, and thank you all for the opportunity to present here on behalf of the Global Burden of Disease Collaboration, the World Health Summit. From Germany to Guatemala to Ghana, GBD collaborators and their work are the foundation of the GBD study and what I present here today. The SDG agenda was adopted two years ago in 2015. Also, for the last two years, I have worked with the GBD collaboration to measure the health-related SDGs. First, with our baseline analysis for 188 countries, which was published last year, and then this year's study, where we generated projections to 2030 for each health indicator and across countries. Together, these results shed light on three main priorities for the SDG era. One, understanding where we are today on the health SDGs. Two, understanding where we must go by 2030. And understanding where to close the gaps on health inequalities so as to bring the SDG aim of leaving no one behind to reality. Like what Alona said, the results I show today represent only a fraction of what we collectively need to understand to accelerate progress in health over the next 13 years. Much more can be explored online with the health-related SDG Viz tool with the website there. 
So today I will focus on examples of the health challenges we currently face and opportunities for intersectoral action during these early years of SDG implementation. The health-related SDG index represents the average performance across 37 health-related indicators. The index includes a range of measures in SDG 3, the health SDG, and several measures outside of the SDG 3, such as child malnutrition indicators, violence and conflict mortality, environmental risks, and mortality due to natural disasters. In sum, the health-related SDG index provides a comparable way of looking how countries are doing today and where they need to go for the future on the health-related SDGs. So as shown on this map for 2016, substantial geographic inequalities exist today. Countries with the highest scores on the health-related SDG index, so those in dark green, include Singapore, Nordic countries, the UK, Canada, and Australia, and a number of Western European countries. Countries that had the lowest scores in 2016, those in red and dark orange, are primarily found in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in Western and Central Africa. In the next few slides, we will look into what might be contributing to some of these disparities. So for the countries, the 15 countries with the highest SDG index scores in 2016, two patterns are most striking. Overall, these countries are performing well across a wide range of health needs, so those in green, which include women's and child health, both infectious and non-communicable diseases, and environmental risks. Nonetheless, most of these countries face health, health challenges, shown in reds and oranges, that require intersectoral action to most effectively tackle them. These challenges include childhood overweight, suicide mortality, and alcohol use. So on the other end of the spectrum, the 15 countries with the lowest SDG index scores in 2016, somewhat different patterns emerge. Overall, these countries are generally facing a variety of health challenges, as shown in oranges and reds, which could reflect long-standing gaps in health system investments. At the same time, some of these countries show high scores on interventions like vaccine coverage, and for some risk factors, such as smoking prevalence. In the case of vaccine coverage, these results emphasize the potential impact of deliberate investments in health systems and why investing in health is so important in the SDG era. Understanding where countries are and where they may go based on past trends is essential for informing strategic investment decisions in the SDG era. The prevalence of child overweight is a health issue in which very minimal progress has occurred in the past. In fact, rates have either been stagnant or are increasing, or have been increasing since 1990. Subsequently, unless concerted action is taken to address the factors related to child overweight today and going forward, millions of children will face the health, health consequences associated with being overweight or obese. As emphasized throughout the World Health Summit, and certainly by this panel today, intersectoral action is vital to accelerating progress in the health, uh, to accelerate uh, progress on, in health over the next 13 years. Road injury mortality is one such example. No country is projected to meet the SDG target for road injury mortality which calls for a 50% reduction between 2015 and 2020. Based on, past, based on past trends, Spain is projected to have the largest increase, or decrease at 25%. So to accelerate progress in the next few years, 
Actors beyond the health system will need to prioritize and fund programs and policies that make roads and all types of transportation safer for everyone. Of course, the health system will play, plays an important role in how people survive and then thrive after road injuries occur through the provision of high quality trauma care and rehabilitation services. But the health system alone cannot reduce road injury mortality, and the health sector alone will not make roads safer for drivers, pedestrians, and passengers alike. Beyond knowing where we are and where we need to go for the health SDGs, we need to bring the global goals within reach of all populations by 2030. To leave no one behind, we must focus where there are the greatest health inequalities. For example, global progress on under five mortality is often highlighted as one of global health's greatest success stories. And globally it is, with six million fewer children dying in 2016 than in 1990. If you project the global average for under five mortality to 2030, based on past trends, we will meet the SDG target of 25 deaths per thousand live births. However, if you look at the countries with the highest and lowest rates of under five mortality and what their futures may hold, an enormous gap remains. To truly succeed in the SDG era, we must focus on the places which bear the largest health burdens. Progress on the SDGs is possible, but not inevitable. This is what Bill and Melinda Gates stressed during the UN General Assembly last month. Their goalkeepers report, which used GBD projections on the health-related SDGs, showed the potential to accelerate gains against diseases like HIV, as shown in the teal area of this graph. But if we lose momentum, or if we cut funding for health, the progress we have made could easily be erased. We have 13 years until 2030. During this time, the GBD collaboration, its work on measuring the health-related SDGs, can help us collectively chart a better future for health for all populations throughout the world and to ultimately bring the SDG ambition of leaving no one behind closer to reality. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nancy. I think it's always helpful to start with uh, data to know where we actually are and uh, to also see the long-term trends, possible projections, because it also indicates where that action needs to be and where political choices are made. I'd like to turn first to Dr. Moeti, and of course, if we saw those uh, uh, pictures, all the red was more or less concentrated, with some exceptions, in your region. And Nancy just drew attention, we have 13 more years. What can you, uh, as the regional director of WHO, together with your countries, but also together with the rest of WHO do to move this forward, to accelerate that, and to really reach the poorest and most vulnerable in your region? Please, Dr. Moeti. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, thanks for having invited me to be on this, uh, on this panel, and thanks to Nancy for having showed us that data. Very uh, sobering. I guess, and inspiring us to, uh, to do much better, to do a lot. So what can WHO do? First, uh, we have defined in the region, and we see it echoed in the policies and priorities of our new Director General, the need for focus on universal health coverage and improving health systems in countries, including, very importantly, the issue of financing. Which, uh, which has already been, been, uh, been mentioned. So it's been estimated that low and middle income countries, in order for us to reach the SDGs, will have to invest about $134 billion 
dollars a year more than is happening now. And we can try and draw this down to the African region where we have some of the biggest gaps in financing for health. So we are working not only to advocate for increased domestic investment in health, and not only in the health sector in the, and in the health budget, but also in making the link between the other sectors based on the determinants that will make a difference, that will help to accelerate the, the improvement in health in some of the mechanisms that we are putting in, in, in place in countries now. So we are working with ministries of health to help them develop an investment case in health based on a country-specific assessment of what is needed, and then working with them to present this case to ministers of finance, for example, because we've understood that it's not enough to try and pull their heartstrings and tell them how people will be suffering and children will be dying. Apparently, this does not make the case sufficiently. We need to make an economic investment case and show that investing in health will bring dividends for socioeconomic development in countries. And this we are doing better. We are also working increasingly with those decision makers that will sign off on the national budget that the Minister of Finance will present, the parliamentarians. And we've seen in a number of countries that, in fact, if we work well enough with the health committees, those within the decision makers who are most concerned and most informed about health, they can actually block the approval of a budget, and this has happened in a number of countries, before they are satisfied that as much effort has been made in investing in health. That's one. Secondly, it's not enough to have additional financing, not only from the private, from the public purse, but also from the private sector an area that needs exploration in our countries because we see that uh, in some countries the private sector plays a strong health provision role. Of course, we know that the private sector is also developing new technologies that need to be adopted. But we have not yet sufficiently explored how the private, private sector can contribute to financing in supporting health insurance, in reducing the need for out-of-pocket payments, and contributing to social protection so that people can access health care better. So one area on which we are working very strongly is around financing and universal health coverage more broadly, supporting countries in relation to their human resources, where again we need to see huge increases in the numbers in our countries. And meanwhile, we are working with other partners to support countries to work on task shifting and use the human resources that are available, helping them to develop the policies to do this in a structured way and to ensure that these are sustainable learning from experience in the past where we had voluntary community health workers which were not consistently used, which were not sustainable. So that, that's one area, just not to speak for too long. Secondly, so this is in the public policy space, health policy, and then we are working with countries to very much explore the potential of influencing the policies of other sectors, so addressing the link with the other SDGs, addressing the social determinants of health, and ensuring that we advocate, we provide data and evidence to influence sectors like education, trade, very importantly, in terms of some of the drivers of some of the problems that Nancy was highlighting in, in developed countries, which are also a problem in low and middle income countries. Child, uh, child overweight is occurring at the same time as severe child mal undernutrition in our countries, so they need to deal with both of these factors. And we have worked in a number of countries to help them to develop mechanisms for engaging the other sectors, influencing their policies, influencing their investments. This goes across sectors like water and sanitation in relation to some of the outbreaks of cholera and uh, other waterborne diseases that we are seeing in a number of countries. In Botswana, for example, we worked, WHO has worked with the Ministry of Health to influence a range of sectors on road traffic accidents. So that, that's a, a country with significant uh, mortality from road traffic accidents. So we've worked with the transport sector, with the justice sector, with the police, and influenced them to set certain standards, in, initiate certain investments, and actually implementation, so that uh, there is more, if you like, rigorous prevention interventions to, to reduce the number of uh, road traffic accident deaths. So I, I just in a nutshell, universal health coverage, attention to financing, and of course with a strong focus on equity, and then addressing the social determinants of health through 
intersectoral action and influence in the policies of other sectors. So we're seeing quite a new type of activity and action from the side of the World Health Organization, very much focused on advising countries, very concretely helping them develop investment cases, reaching out to uh, the finance ministers, reaching out to other ministers. Can I ask you two follow-up questions? One is, are you seeing, based on the SDGs and the kind of analyses that Nancy's Institute has done, etc., are you seeing a different behavior of, let me put it in one basket of donors, on the one hand, and are you seeing a different political relevance or priority of health in the country, in the countries of Africa. I understand the African Union is much more interested and committed to health now. So could you speak about those two sides? The donors, are they different? Do they behave differently? And the countries, do they behave differently? Okay. Uh, I'll start with the first, which is the more challenging of your questions. I, I, in, I would say that um, at the peak of the Millennium Development Goals, where there was a strong drive for progress, we saw um, a very strong push for more alignment, better alignment and better harmonization by the donors in encouraging and promoting, if you like, the ownership by, at least in our region, by, by gov national governments and the, the drive towards uh, budget support, pooling of resources, um, integration of uh, things like uh, monitoring and evaluation and reporting system, all aimed at a more integrated approach to providing aid and reducing the costs, if you like, to the governments of uh, benefiting from the support of these countries. We had a, an initiative called the International Health Partnership Plus, where these principles were very strongly being articulated and actually implemented by partners. This seemed to lose a certain level of enthusiasm and application, and I suppose it encountered the realities of what actually are the demands in the donor countries themselves for being able to obtain more money. So we've seen more of a retreat to the more vertical approaches again, and this initiative or this, these principles and this approach is being re Vitalized. There's, a, there's a new move to, to re-establish it in the interest of, of, the, of the sustainable development goals. So, however, we are seeing more of an emphasis among the donors on universal health coverage, at least in the leadership of some of the, the leading Western countries in the statements of this as a priority in the, in the context of the sustainable development goals. I think what needs to happen now is to see how this is followed by a new way of financing health development in countries with, a better, with, with, with more of an emphasis on this more integrated approach addressing health systems themselves, uh, balancing what has continued to be very verticalized, fragmented, disease-specific, populations, subgroup-specific financing, which then requires great effort of for coordination and pooling and achievement of efficiencies and synergies on the part of the government and other part implementing partners receiving this funding. So I would say that there is need for more effort in this direction and there is need to perhaps follow the specific priorities articulated by countries in the way in which partners are providing support. Um, and then the second question about the countries well, I was uh, saying that, you know, there needs to be political commitment and uh, there has been mm -hmm. a tendency also by WHO to reach out to heads of government, to reach out to regional mm -hmm. political organizations. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned national parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a shift there in countries in terms of seeing health as a truly political issue? If uh, Dr. Tedros says health is a political choice, he mm -hmm. said in the speech mm -hmm. to us here, universal health coverage is a political choice. Are you seeing the politicians being more interested, more supportive, more ready to move forward? I think we are seeing this in a number of ways in countries. We are seeing a number of countries that have actually increased their investment in, in, in health as a sector, not to the degree that we would like to see, to be quite honest. So we're not seeing yet the per capita investment in health that WHO is recommending for the delivery of a basic package in most countries. We're starting, however, to, to, to see the understanding 
about uh, the importance of equity and the establishment of different mechanisms to reduce the burden on households in acquiring, in, in, in improving their health. There is a lot of effort still to make because we've observed that when it's time to set priorities, of course it's difficult for ministers of finance, they quite often turn around and say to the health ministers, you need to be more efficient. You need to demonstrate better your results. You need to be more coherent and not come with a list of diseases, each of which is competing for my attention in a fragmented way. Come with your story coherently packaged and explain why I should invest in health as opposed to something else. I think that um, we need to see the translation of some of the decisions that are being made, for example, at the level of the African Union, at the level of the regional economic communities, really into health finding its place in negotiation, for example, with the global financing institutions, where we understood there is still much uh, progress to be made. Of course, we, we understand now that infrastructure is very important for health, so we don't cavil and the fact that infrastructure is, is, is a priority since it serves so many development sectors. But I think there is some improvement, some movement. We'd like to see a lot more translation of these this statements of commitment. Thank you very much. I'm turning to Justin McCarthy, who is sort of the private sector voice here. And if we look at those countries that were in the red, uh, some of your companies are richer uh, than the GNP of some of these countries. And uh, the private sector has uh, stated that they see themselves part of the SDG implementation. They uh, consistently uh, draw attention to the fact that particularly goal 17 is absolutely critical for the private sector. There's the global compact, there's the WEF initiatives, etc., etc. How do you see that? What kind of change of thinking have you seen in the private sector and how has the shift of global responsibility happened from pure charity to something else? Can you share that with us, please? Sure. Uh, th thank you, first of all, for having me on the panel and to the World Health Summit for really bringing together a diverse group of stakeholders. I think that makes for a much richer discussion, especially when we're talking about partnerships and the need for more sort of multi-dimensional uh, solutions. So. Um, I'll, I'll start out really by getting right to your question about how I've seen things evolved and how the partnerships changed. And I've, I've been with Pfizer for 24 years now, and I've seen dramatic change in the way we do partnerships. But, and I think you know, tying it to the sustainable development goals is really uh, important because part of how I've seen the, the partnerships evolve relate to trying to develop more sustainable partnerships. And, you know, Pfizer and others across the industry have historically been involved in donations and access programs as individual companies for decades, but what I've seen the evolution towards is a much more, a much greater focus on multi-sectorial partnerships that really try to get at the heart of the health systems issues that underlie the problems. And I'll, I'll share maybe a couple examples of, of, of how we've, we've done that, but I think the most successful partnerships are those that really bring together um, stakeholders from across the, the healthcare sector, government, civil society, um, the private sector, uh, disease organizations that can really bring unique aspects to the partnership and they all have something invested and they all have accountability. I think that's critical to any of these partnerships going forward. I'll give you one really what I think is one of the best examples of this and it's Gavi, the Glo Global Alliance for Vaccines. And um, you know, Nancy mentioned the, the vaccine coverage. I, th I think Gavi is probably part of, not the explanation, but part of the reason why we're having better vaccine coverage. And Gavi is, a, I think, a really interesting partnership that brings together uh, vaccine manufacturers to produce and provide a dozen vaccines for childhood diseases. Uh, it brings together uh, donor countries, uh, developing countries uh, who, will, who need access to the vaccines, uh, the Gates Foundation as a private funder, uh, UNICEF that is a, the procurer. Um, it brings together civil society to make sure the vaccines get to the, uh, get to the patients. It brings together WHO um, as the regulator. And everyone has something that they've committed and everyone gets something out of the partnership. For us, uh, Pfizer, we um, 
manufacture our Prevnar vaccine for pneumococcal disease, uh, and uh, we have uh, manufactured a special uh, delivery mechanism that tries to address some of the cold chain challenges in the supply chain to actually get uh, the, the vaccine to the end user. Uh, but that program, I think, has been one of the most sustainable and successful partner health, par public health partnerships. You know, in the last five years, I believe about uh, 500 million children have been vaccinated and over 7 million lives saved because of that partnership. And in the coming five years, the target is to vaccinate another 300 children, which would equate to about another five or six million lives. But I think the success of that is everyone has something committed to the partnership. Everyone feels accountable. Uh, and everyone is delivering. And I think one of the most, the biggest innovations from the private sector's perspective on Gavi is the advanced market commitment, where the, the donors and the governments commit upfront to long-term funding that enables the manufacturers to provide supply at a much greatly reduced cost. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one example. Maybe I'll, I'll stop yeah, there. Yeah. I have others we can get Yeah, I, I have a follow-up question because, you know, after we've uh, been over the last 10 years or so developing these kind of partnerships, I nearly think they seem easy. We've got used to them. We're moving them forward. We're applying them to other areas. But if I'm thinking, you know, you saw those obesity figures there. There's a major part of the private sector that's truly harmful to health. And uh, it's a sector, you know, that's not been considered a health sector. You know, some people call it big food, uh, big soda, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm finding it incredibly difficult to speak of the private sector as such, because parts of the private sector harm health and parts of the private sector can contribute to health. Whereas when one talks with the private sector, they rarely touch on those other sides, you know, uh, and uh, you talk to chambers of commerce and they of course include the tobacco industry, which means as WHO you can't work with the chambers of commerce. So, uh, why is it that you're so protective of each other? Well, it's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would say we're protective of each other. Um, but I think you raise a really good point uh, when it comes to the growing burden of non-communicable diseases. All right? They're the leading cause of death right now around the world. You know, 75% plus of those deaths occur in low and lower middle income countries. The situation is even more dire in Africa, um, where cancer deaths now outpace deaths by malaria and tuberculosis, and they're expected to double by 2030. 20, by 2030. Um, when you look at breast cancer survival rates, five-year survival rate in the United States is 90%. In uh, Gambia, it's 12%. Uganda, 45%. Um, so huge disparities, and I think it's a, that uh, disparity that, that Nancy highlighted earlier. But you know, when you think about these non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, some cancers, many of them are preventable and manageable through diet, exercise, behavioral lifestyle choices. And you know, when we talk about partnerships going forward and how do we actually um, address that growing burden, it's, it's not just going to be by treatment, although that's a big part of it. We have to find a way to educate and address the behavioral issues um, and the, the lifestyle and behavioral choices, and that involves discussing it with, you know, food companies and tobacco companies, smoking, uh, diet. These are really important underlying health issues that have to be addressed along with treatment. Um, I can't speak for the food industry or the tobacco industry, I'm sorry, but... Do you think uh, the soda tax is a good idea? Uh, I actually do think taxes on uh, smoking cigarettes and, um, and, and sodas, I actually think that is a fair and reasonable societal choice. Thank you. 
You want to say a short comment, yes? No, I, I did just want to make a, a short comment to say it needs to be a combination of, if you like, public education, behavioral, which means individual behavior, and also public policy measures like the taxation, like regulation. I think those are extremely important in combination. What we see from the, some of the industries is a strong emphasis on individuals must behave properly. So you mustn't drink in excess. And you kids mustn't start uh, smoking, ignoring, if you like, the promotion, the advertising, the pressure. So I do believe that it really needs to be a combination of education, individual behavior change, and very strong public policies that yeah. affect, affect some of this. Yeah. Thank you for reinforcing that. And I think that's also where the terminology we're using for using now comes from, that there was so much talk about individual choices that we try to move the agenda to the political choices that need to be made. And they, of course, relate to taxation, trade, many of these issues, the accessibility of products, the composition of products, all those things. El Haja, see, if we discuss these kind of things to the right of me, and I think of the kind of problems you confront every day. Joanne Liu also spoke to us about the situation in Bangladesh with the Moinga uh, refugees, etc. How do you feel? At the same time, we all know, we know it's important to invest and, and to give uh, resources to humanitarian effort, but unless we invest in long-term structural stuff, we don't, you know, we don't protect ourselves. So how do you deal with this and uh, how do you think the SDGs can help us deal with this? Thank you. Uh, if we look at them uh, through the lens of uh, people in need and through the lens of people that are in those settings, the lines are blur and blur by the day. If we take an example of a protracted crisis where it is not rare today to go to a refugee camp and then find people in their mid-twenties and they were born in that same refugee camp. They did not know anything else but to live in that setting. So what does development mean for that person or what does emergency or humanitarian setting mean for that person? Unfortunately, what we are seeing is that you know, those settings are multiplying by the day because of uh, disasters, because of conflicts, because of all kinds of emergencies. And in those settings, we have 60% uh, of children that are not immunized. More than 50% uh, of maternal children, adolescents, and newborn deaths are happening in those very settings. And that was in those settings where the needs are greatest, yet hardest to reach, yet you know, more dangerous. But uh, the SDGs are talking about you know, leaving no one behind and looking at also, from a negative point of view, to walk the last mile to those people. Well, if it is true, and I believe it is true, that is in those very places where the needs are greatest, maybe we should flip it and make the last mile our first mile. First mile to respond you know, to the needs of people, you know, that children you know, can reach their fifth birthday, that women be protected, that the humanitarian space also be safe enough for health workers to intervene and in health facilities you know, be protected you know, at the same time. So if you look at the situation in those places, unfortunately, those are the very places where there is often no doctor, there is often no school, there is often no government structure. And that is in those places where trust is totally broken, you know, where many promises are being made and none of those promises being held. So that is not only the diseases that needs to be healed, that is the relationship with the people and the communities that must be healed too. And then the trust you know, being restored you know, in that. And that is not uh, from a health point of view and a public health point of view, something like a favor that you do for those people. It is a protection for all of us. You know, from an epidemic, uh, epidemiological point of view, none of us will be really safe until all of us you know, are safe with regard you know, to those kind of health challenges that are haunting us you know, by the day. 
I used to say that neglected diseases are diseases of neglected people. And then they change and then they mutate, you know, two priorities, you know, as soon as they get out of the confines, you know, of neglected people. But today, with the combination, you know, of those protracted crises, the breakdown of the systems across the board and even the lack of government and governance, what we are seeing today is a globalization of the fragilities. The world is global, for sure, interconnected more than ever before, for sure. But therefore, the fragilities in that world do not become also global. And the question is, are we really equipped you know, to respond you know, to those effectively? Well, many things you know, can be done, of course, and I agree with all the points that uh, my pre previous speakers you know, made. But investing in communities, strengthening their capacities, Building the community systems alongside the health systems at the same way is critical. That is in the communities where people realize that something unusual is going on. That is there that they realize that more people are dying this year than the year before. That's there they realize that there is food, should, food shortage this year. That's there they realize animals are dying. Community surveillance becomes also as important as the normal are the formal health and epidemiological surveillance, and they need to be complementary. Another dimension of it, of course, is you know, our own behaviors and attitudes, our consumption habits you know, that also have been impacting you know, on the environment. Rapid unplanned urbanization, climate change, as demographic pressure, all of us going more and more into sharing the habitat with the fauna. Well, the bat can live with Ebola, we cannot live with it. You know, the green monkey can live you know, with many other diseases, we cannot. It is about also looking at you know, health from a wider point of view and bringing an equity you know, dimension to it. And that's the reason why we think that local action is critical. The World Humanitarian Summit is putting a particular emphasis on the role of local actors, and we totally subscribe to that. It is a little bit unfortunate that the discussion is hijacked you know, by how much money will be going to, each, to which actor. But beyond money, what does it mean is really to empower and work with those who understand the socioeconomic determinants, those who can build the trust and deal with difficult issues, difficult issues that are related to death, related to barriers, related to procreation, related you know, to the uh, relationship to the environments and you know, to the cultural and socioeconomic di dimension. And that's where then the trust that needs to be rebuilt and then the partnership that you mentioned at the beginning you know, becomes you know, extremely critical. We, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, in, that is the norm and where we work in, 17 million volunteers on the ground working in those very communities and be there all the time, and I'm stressing here all the time, it is not in the middle of, of a crisis that you will build a partnership. It is not in the middle of a shock that you will build a partnership. And we should also remember that communities do remember. They remember who was there before, who was there during, and who was there after. And there are many crises today when the shock arrives, you go to the airports in those very countries, it is full of people not coming, but living. And living exactly when the communities are needing them most. Living exactly you know, where people need solidarity. And that is in those times that when flights you know, get cancelled, borders get closed, and then people you know, what will not be reached you know, out to. And everything we are experiencing today is reminding us that situation. Ebola before, we have today uh, while we speak, and some of us will be flying tonight to Madagascar, where we are experiencing a plague, you know, epidemic, right now when we are speaking, and there is only one way to handle those that is exactly where it is happening, and that is in the communities where the outbreaks happen, and it is in the communities, you know, where it will be contained. And if the SDGs are serious about equity, about the last mile, then let's together partner to turn the last mile into a first mile because that's where the needs are greatest.
Thank you, Elaj. I want to ask a similar follow-up question that uh, I asked of, of Dr. Moeti, and that is, have you seen changes of behavior? Because, of course, you have, when a crisis emerges, but also for your, let me say, everyday business, you have to fundraise. You have to go out there and say, you know, give us the support, uh, both, you know, for helping in this crisis, but also helping our volunteers who are there regularly, who actually bear the brunt, who are the people who died in the outbreaks, because they are the ones that are there first. And uh, they are the first responders. They are actually our health security, those people. Have you seen a change over the last couple of years? Do you get more support? Do you get different type of support? Or is it getting more difficult because there's more crises? It is a mixed situation. We have to realize that the geographic uh, location of a crisis will determine the level of support or not. Well, there are crises that are very well funded, overfunded, while at the same time there are crises you know, that are underfunded, totally neglected. Well, if we talk about today you know, humanitarian situations, of course we think of Syria, rightly so. Funding is flowing at a relatively reasonable pace. If we talk about you know, migration crisis and refugee crisis, well, and we think close to Europe, Greece, and Turkey, then it is funded. But at the same time, there are 4.5 million you know, refugees and migrants in the sub-Saharan Africa. And that is not funded. Uganda alone is home to 1 million refugees. Ethiopia is home to 700,000 refugees. One third of Lebanese population is composed of refugees. And, of course, there it is not, you know, funded, you know, the level it should be. And if we transfer that to the domain of health and then and development, well, if the crisis or the challenge, you know, become a global threat, you know, and the funding comes, but the question is, is the funding going proportionately to the right place? Well, of course, you know, if there is a fear of a rapid propagation, you will see heavy, heavy, heavy funding you know, going into, be it infrastructure in airports that are thousands of miles away of where it is happening, you know, some research and then deployments, you know, of medical teams and so on. But if it is about investing to strengthen the systems so that those very communities be able to withstand the next shock when they come next time around, the funding level is, you know, very, very low. So we shouldn't be surprised then if you know, the fragility continues and, you know, those very places cannot withstand the next shocks when they come. One very important, you know, element that we've noticed, and I'm paying tribute here to Dr. Moeti, WHO, to I just returned, you know, from Mali, when because of the shock, all the health facilities were deserted. They were totally deserted because of fear, and I totally understand that. They were deserted also because of many, many other reasons that will also communicate the fragility of the systems. But WHO chipping in and then providing 50 doctors deployed in all those places where the needs you know, are greatest. And it is not only anymore about advising, it is not only more putting norms and standards that we all know, it's about also taking real action and then deploying people where they need it most. And I think this is, these are changes in the right direction that we all salute. Is it a good step? Yes, we salute it. Is it enough? No, because we have not yet in any shape or form match the scale and magnitude of the challenges that we are facing today. Thank you, and thank you for drawing attention to that. I'm partly involved also in helping shape uh, the new program of work of the WHO, and it's very, very clear, and I'll ask you to comment on that in a minute that the role of organization changes. We said governance has to change. And that means that the role of organizations has to change because the context has changed. 
I would say, you know, the humanitarian sector is coming closer to the development sector. The emergency sector is coming closer to development. The private sector is coming close to a, a number of, uh, of these uh, organizations. And I actually remember, and I wonder if there's a comment you have, Justin, on that, that a number of private sector companies said, you could have asked us much more, you could have used us much more in the Ebola crises but you did not do that. So if you uh, listen uh, to what El Haji just said now, where do you see the role of the private sector in relation to these big humanitarian challenges? Would you have a comment on that? Yeah. Uh, sure, I, I mean, I, I do think there's a huge role for the, the private sector in the humanitarian crises as well as some of the other uh, longer term issues that we've been facing, like you mentioned neglected tropical diseases earlier, we talked about NCDs. You know, there's, there's a lot that the private sector can bring beyond just its products, right? We, I mean, we, our innovation is probably the most important thing that we can bring, new treatments to address unmet medical need, but also new delivery systems, new uh, methods of manufacturing that address some of the unique challenges in some of these markets. But we also bring broader resources, people who can help, funding, um, as well as our products. But we also bring, you know, experience companies like Pfizer, global companies. We've operated in, in, in hundreds of markets around the world. We bring a very much an implementation and an execution mindset to, to a partnership. So I think there's lots of different strengths that the private sector can contribute. Uh, I do think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the broader the partnership to address the underlying health systems issues that have been raised uh, throughout the uh, discussion are critically important. I, I think back about how we engaged, you know, five years ago with neglected tropical diseases with the London De Declaration where the pharmaceutical industry came together with governments to try to eliminate or control 10 neglected tropical diseases by 2020. Um, I don't think we're going to succeed in eliminating them, but we're making progress, um, significant progress. And I think about our company, we've been involved for, since the beginning to try to eliminate trachoma. And we've donated over 600 million doses of an antibiotic to help contribute to that. But, you know, when I talked earlier about non-communicable diseases, we've, we're thinking about how do we take what we've learned in the NTD space and broaden it to non-communicable diseases. And what we've done is try to expand our partnerships to try to address some of those health systems issues. And, you know, it's difficult for us to address financing of governments and policy issues and reforms. So uh, this time around, we brought together the industry, 23 companies, but we also partnered with the World Bank and the Union for International Cancer Control to really try to get at a broader partnership to really address the underlying health systems issues. And, you know, beyond that partnership, there's a lot of groups that are uh, getting involved in NCDs. I, I actually think NCDs, given the size of the burden, is probably underfunded compared to some things. And I think, you know, there needs to be an entity or organization that tries to convene the individual efforts that are ongoing to try to address NCDs, to try to bring it together in a, in a broader umbrella coalition because the the challenge is so massive. So, you know, I, the private sector, just in, in summary, I think brings more than just products uh, to the partnership. And it really is trying to partner in a way that is very different than in the old model to try to uh, broaden the partnership to address the underlying issues as well as just the access to medicines issue. Dr. Moriti, could you explain something to us? And it follows uh, uh, from what El Hajasi said. Dr. Tedros has said WHO is getting more operational. Mm. Uh, some people are a bit ambivalent about that, but he's absolutely adamant. We've heard an example uh, already of what that means. Could you explain that a little bit more to us? But could you also say, what does it mean in relation to other actors? Does it mean, you know, next to all these other players that are already there at the country level being operational in one way or the other, and often tripping over each other, uh, that WHO is going to be one of the pack? Or what is it going to be that is very specific about that operational role of the World Health Organization? Okay, thank you. Uh, I mean, of course, this is 
ideas that are in the process of being clarified and uh, <coughs> adopted in the organization. The most obvious fear is in humanitarian crises and in response to outbreaks of a certain magnitude and, and severity, where WHO is not only going to be in the background providing technical advice, but is actually going to be deploying people to play certain roles. And I think the, what happened in the latter part of the response to the Ebola outbreak was an example of this. So we had WHO staff deployed, working at the district level, coordinating teams that were working on surveillance, providing training to treatment centers, et cetera, even working with uh, others at, on um, dialogue with communities in order to enable things to happen. So this is different from how WHO would normally be focused mainly at the, glo at, at the central level, at the national level, providing advice, maybe providing training, doing monitoring and evaluation. It's very clear that this is, and it is actually happening in a number of um, humanitarian crises, outbreaks, it's happening very much in Ethiopia in supporting the cholera outbreak in the Somali region and in other places, in the Central African Republic, in Northeastern Nigeria, etc. So where WHO is playing essentially multiple roles, providing policy, advice, technical support at the central level, working with the other health actors, I think this is a very strong, uh, important uh, distinction to make that not only are we deploying WHO staff, but we are also coordinating very often the deployment of other actors. So it's not only WHO that's providing some of the capacity for different functions in responding to an outbreak or supporting the response to a humanitarian crisis, but very often groups like the GOAN, other technical experts deploy through the WHO system. We've worked with the Africa CDC, for example, in responding to outbreaks in uh, the DRC and in Ethiopia, where our infrastructure and system is used to help them to, to function. And also we support the coordination of the interventions of the different health actors and work with them to mobilize resources jointly for what is going to happen in health. We have in a number of these instances got uh, sub-offices at the peripheral level, at the district level, at the provincial level, which form as a hub, form a hub for the health actors to also come and, and uh, be deployed and coordinate what you're doing. So we are doing both uh, supporting very directly uh, management in these areas. We have our staff in emergency operating centers working side by side with government staff to follow alerts, carry out surveillance, and, and those types of functions to respond to an outbreak. Now, what, what we need to think further about, and here I think the intention is to tailor the level of operationality, if you like, to the needs of a country. We have countries in the African region that are not in crisis, but where the capacity to manage the system for health, particularly at the peripheral level, getting down to the district level, to the interface with the communities, helping to make that more effective, where the gaps are, are huge in some of these countries. So I think the intention is for us to be more present at that level, at least at the district level, supporting those aspects, of course, working with other health actors. And then other countries with more capacity where we will continue to play more of a normative advisory, monitoring and evaluation and helping the government to coordinate the health sector. And this is what we're going to be doing. Thank you. al -Hajj, do you... Uh welcome such a move uh, and uh, where do you think it works but where do you think there could be some problems i, I would welcome it because uh, often uh, one makes reference to the fact that we may be too many and then uh, tipping on uh, each other's toes uh, that's not my experience I, my experience we're too few where we are needed most i mean if it is in some big capital cities of nice places you know, in Africa, of course, you know, you have, you know, some quite a critical mass, you know, of people, you know, sitting either in Dakar or in Nairobi or I don't know, in another place again. But then if you go to where really the needs are, I don't have any co coordination problem because sometimes there's nobody to coordinate with. Well, and I really, to be very honest, uh, in the early days, you know, of the Ebola, uh, when I arrived, you know, in Freetown and in Conakry, the airport was mushrooming of people and development workers, 
including health workers and all kind of you know, experts and uh, partners and um, volunteers. They were leaving. They were not coming. They were all leaving you know, at that time. So if you go to a place that is called Kenemo, which is and another one that is called Kailoon, and that's where you had the epicenter you know, of the outbreak, there was absolutely nobody to, to coordinate with. Nobody to coordinate with. If you go today to a Central African Republic where we are facing a major humanitarian crisis, including a health you know, crisis, and you get outside of Bangui, you know, five kilometers outside of Bangui, there is nobody you know, to coordinate with. I was giving the example of Mali. Well, if you're in Kidal or in Tombuktu or now today in Sikas or in Mopti, it is the same. And that's why I was saluting the deployment you know, of those uh, uh, health workers, including doctors you know, by WHO. I think what we really need is a critical mass of people and infrastructure where the needs are greatest. And believe me, it is not just a semantic to turn the last mile into a first mile. It is a true uh, perspective that that's where the needs are greatest. You know, we have to be and then we have to be you know, present. Having said that, of course, we need to work you know, with all the partners to do so. We have to understand that a national response to a health challenge is more than a government response. We have to understand that the global response to health is more than a UN response to health. We have to widen that base of partnership. And I think the, now the scale and magnitude of the problems are forcing us to be a little bit more humble in our partnership. I remember years ago, the, part, the private sector wouldn't even want to talk you know, to us. They said, well, these are idealist people. They are not results focused. You know, they are not you know, all the other qualificatives you know, that we are getting. On the other end, we did not want to talk too much with the private sector because these are the profit makers, the capitalists. They don't care you know, about you know, the situation. And I think we are getting a little bit more humble, all of us, you know, to understand that these situations that we are facing are often bigger than any of us. And also that uh, we question our own certainties about things that we believe you know, works and don't work. And we have to continue to put those same questions. I hear a lot today about innovation and everybody think private sector. That's not a panacea. Or we think of new products you know, or gadgets. No. There is much more in innovation than that. It is people are innovating on a daily basis at the community level, developing strategies of survival where nobody is. People are innovating in the approaches where they communicate you know, difficult issues. People are innovating also in building new innovative partnerships in order to work. So let's not just think of you know, the gadgets you know, or the products or whatever we believe you know, are those uh, you know, innovative uh, kind of products that are coming from the formal or the private sector and be humble again that more than ever before are we facing humanitarian challenges but we don't, that we did not see since the Second World War. Never have we seen so many people on the move since the Second World War. We don't have a Third World War and it is quite worrisome that now the situation that we are facing can only be described with one reference which is the last World War that will I said that has to force us to be humble, but also force us you know, to be you know, more committed to act faster and in a more sustained way in order to make a difference in the lives of so many, but by doing so to protect ourselves at the same time. Thank you, El Hajj. Justin, you heard this, we all have to be more humble. Can you share with us how has your view changed of the United Nations system? You said, you know, you're in this business 25 years or so. How do you think about it 25 years ago? How do you think about it today? And how do you think it could get even better? Uh, well, I do uh, think being humble in terms of how we define innovation is really important. Uh, because the, you know, the innovations that we think about um, you know, on, the, on the pharmaceutical industry are not always the innovations that are needed on the ground. Uh, and you know, maybe a simple change to a delivery system that addresses that last mile issue is true innovation. I mentioned Gavi where I thought the true innovation was the 
funding mechanism that the World Bank came up with. You know, it, it, there's, there's lots of different uh, types of innovation and we have to be much more open-minded about what we think uh, about in terms of innovation and what we want to bring to, uh, bring to solve these problems. Gene therapy is not the type of innovation that we need to solve some of these problems. You know, it's, it's more how do we get the product in the hands of the people who need them. When, you know, when we think about it, so for example, uh, one of the innovations that we're proud of uh, lately was uh, a product that we developed uh, called Cyanopress, which is a, a contraceptive that we worked with uh, Becton Dickinson to develop a subcutaneous injection that can be delivered outside of the clinic and actually self-administered. That's a huge, huge, that's addressing a huge need for family planning in many countries because a simple innovation around how it's administered has had a huge impact. So, you know, it, so our thinking has evolved a lot in terms of what is the innovation that's really needed and who's best uh, in position to decide what that innovation is. So another thing that we've, uh, our thinking has evolved in terms of how we, we have a foundation and how we fund donations and, uh, through, and grants through, the founda through that foundation. We've set up last year uh, what we call the Global Health Innovation Fund. And what that does is it provides grants to local entrepreneurs who are in the best position to solve the social issues in a, in a local market using business models and, and, and practices. And we think that's a much more sustainable uh, method of funding going forward. So, uh, you know, we're trying to seek out these entrepreneurs who are really on the ground, know the problem that needs to be solved, and are coming up with innovative ways to, to solve it. So that's just a, a couple small examples of how we're starting to change our thinking about innovation and what types of innovations are needed to solve some of these problems. And you think you can do that innovation also with the United Nations, or would you say, oh God, here's a bureaucracy, we don't want to? Well, you know, I, I, think, I think that's a mindset we have to move away from. And I, I say it from the private sector because I see it you know, I see it on the receiving end of it. You know, we don't want to partner with the pr private sector. You know, they're, they're profit motivated, whatever the issue is that, you know, there's a stigma about partnering with the private sector, whereas I think, you know, we have a lot we can contribute. And I think we have to be much more open-minded. In my view, the way these things are most successful is, you know, we're not going to agree with everyone on every issue, whether it's the United Nations, WHO, the private sector, the bank, where these conversations are helpful is you have to find the common ground where you do agree and you build a partnership around that. You're never going to solve every problem and resolve every disagreement, but when you, when you get smart people, open-minded people around the table, they can find the areas of common ground and that's the foundation for a successful partnership. So I do think working with the United Nations and other uh, organizations is is entirely possible. You just have to have that conversation about where do we have a common interest and a commonality of interest and build around that. Nancy, you crunched all those data and you showed us a teensy little bit of it. But uh, as you saw all the results yourself, uh, and this is not a, a question of what is uh, the view of your institute, but as you looked at the results, what went through your head? What surprised you most? What shocked you most? What, where do you say, my God, you know, we need to act here, or this trend is never lasting. We had a lunch discussion and we heard, you know, we're still not moving forward on women, for example and it's taking forever, and women don't get power, resources, the health systems they need. So that would be an example of what I'm looking for. You know, where do you say, why on earth aren't we moving here? Or maybe you had a success that you hadn't really expected from the data. Could you share some of that with us? Um, this is oh, wonderful. Uh, first, uh, the work that I presented is really representative of not only many people, many other people crunching numbers, but a very large, expansive collaboration um, throughout the world, which that work would not be possible without. Um, I think for me, especially in this year, I went into this analysis really wanting to shed light on 
where are we potentially leaving people behind, and to frame that in where the early years of SDG implementation, um, the UN Ge Secretary General said, you know, implement implementation has begun, but time is ticking. We do not have the luxury of having a lot of time to tackle these multi-factorial uh, challenges. So I think for me, you know, seeing some of the challenges that we currently face, whether it's in you know, the United States where, yes, absolute levels of uh, maternal mortality are low, but the last few years we see increasing maternal mortality. No mother should be dying uh, during childbirth, yet in a place where we spend the most money um, per capita, we still have mothers dying from childbirth. I think, you know, when you look, and each country has its own challenges, but also its own success stories. And I think, for me, when we were looking through the results and working with our collaborators and trying to make sense of them, um, piecing or parsing out those, those stories and trying to understand where are these places, where are lessons to be learned? Uh, I think the vaccine example and seeing how some countries, um, I think Brazil, Sri Lanka were some of the countries that had among the highest uh, vaccine scores. Um, they may not be the countries that the average person might think would be at the top. Um, to me, that's really important, is how do we shine light on the lessons learned and what has worked in places and how do we apply them elsewhere. I think the last thing, as I've been reflecting on what everyone's talking about, is the, important of measure, the importance of measuring what the challenges are and where we're progressing. Because what we don't measure, we can't know. What we don't know, we can't act on. Thank you very much for that, Nancy, and thank you also for drawing our attention to the fact that obviously the SDGs are for all countries, and uh, not, we don't only see progress in countries of the so-called developed world, we also see rollbacks, and we see rollbacks, as you indicate, in child mortality, we see increasing health inequalities in our part of the world, we see sinking uh, vaccination rates, so that actually we are becoming a health security risk for the others, even though we prefer to see it the other way around. So there are also those shifts back and forth that uh, are very, very worrisome. And uh, we're also seeing, as I indicated, political rollbacks. And again, I have to say, in relation to sexual health and rights, in relation to human rights, uh, that are very, very worrisome again. That's why I'd like to ask each of you uh, to give a, a short closing statement. And I'm sort of thinking, obviously, we'd love to see you all back here at the World Health Summit next year. It's our 10th anniversary. It's going to be a very important meeting. Uh, we heard there is no time to be lost. There is absolutely no time to be lost. So, uh, Dr. Moeti, if you think, uh, what is it that you've really set yourself for the next 12 months where you say, I, together with my region, together with the WHO context, I really want to move forward and I'd want to report that back to the World Health Summit next year. What would that be and how could people here help? Thank you. I, I, I just to follow up on what Nancy said, we are also very aware that the clock is ticking and countries have taken some time to develop their SDG frameworks to figure out how to put all of this together in workable ways. So I think a year and a half, a couple of years has been sent, spent in this, in this exercise in countries. So I, the sense of urgency to really get going on some of these new ways of working on the ground to get them, uh, to try them in a sense, to, 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 to find, we in WHO are proposing, we developed a framework on universal health coverage. We're very much aware that the different parts of a health system have been worked on like vertical programs. We've worked on human resources here, on procurement systems somewhere else, on financing somewhere else. And it is not in very many countries that we've really worked effectively on putting it all together to see how it can work to develop what we like to call a patient-centered um, 
with uh, homegrown solutions health system that is providing equitable care to people. So one of the things I'd like to do is to really take this framework which aims at this and get it working in a number of countries. I'm, I'm always putting myself in the place of a minister of health who has ideas, advice coming at him from all directions, who now is supposed to accelerate, sort out your health system, which is so fragmented and verticalized. And at the same time, work with myriad other sectors to address different problems in health and scale all of this up. This, this is what is facing a Minister of Health. So my, my two ambitions is to try out this work on universal health coverage in a number of countries, be coherent about it, get to the district level, see how to help the governments coordinate the actors, reach out to other actors, and I very much uh, would like to agree with us in his statements about engaging the communities and making space for all actors to work, and see how this delivers and prove, again, uh, the point made by Nancy, that if you work like this, you will deliver for child health. You'll improve immunization. You will start to better address NCDs if you really try to find a way to integrate into a more functional health system, the needs, the essential medicines that are needed to treat these diseases, for example. And then secondly, we have a lot to learn about how to have a manageable process for working with other sectors, I believe. I very often hear people saying the prime minister needs to chair a multi-sectoral cabinet committee. If I were a Prime Minister, I'd refuse to chair multiple committees addressing different diseases with different combinations of sectors. So we need to find ways to engage with and support the policy development of other sectors which are manageable in countries which have capacity gaps. So again, this is another area that I'd like to see moving forward in implementation with more coherence in countries with support from WHO with hopefully better tools than we have now. Thank you. Justin, what would your ambitions be? And who would you like to discuss next year at the World Health Summit so, with finance ministers or well, with who? I'll, I'll actually, you know, I had mentioned earlier the uh, NCD coalition that we are starting to launch, and we launched it this year at the World Economic Forum. So it's really just starting. Um, I would love to be able to come back here next year and one report on concrete progress. But secondly, what I'd really like to be able to do is talk about how we've been able to broaden the coalition to, to tap into you know, other groups that are focused on NCDs. Much more specifically, I'd love to be back here next year saying how we're working with WHO and the Red Cross on NCDs and some of these other partnerships. Excellent. Offer and cooperation. Fantastic. El Hajj, where would you like to be? First of all, uh, reflecting uh, on the uh, SDGs, that the goals are not taken into isolation, but that we also look at the linkages between uh, all the goals. And then have it that's comprehensive, you know, look at it, you know, will make it a little bit more impactful on people. Second, that the, as comprehensive as they might be, you know, the SDGs alone will not cut it either. So in the, when we were the, working on the SDGs, more or less around the same time, there was another process on uh, disaster risk reduction that led to Sendai and the Sendai Framework for Action. Almost around the same time, there was a COP, you know, that uh, led to, you know, this agreement on climate. Around the same time, there was the World Humanitarian Summit that came out with the Grand Bargain. So it looks like all those processes, you know, are so different and have nothing to do with each other, but at the end of the day, you know, they all are related, and in an ideal world, maybe we should not have four different processes that could have only be, should have been only one, because in the rise, you know, of those people that are impacted most, it is, you know, more or less the same, because those people, they suffer, you know, the multiple deprivations, you know, that uh, we are seeing, you know, by the day. The other uh, thing that is, the other point which is very important is, we can have those frameworks, we can have the institutions, we mention all of our institutions, but what will make a difference at the end of the day is really real leadership. You know, leadership in those institutions, you know, that will take, you know, the, to, to take really the ambitions, you know, at a much higher level. And I believe that there are people, normal people who care, 
in the private sector, people who care in the UN, people who care in all those institutions. So, and I would like to see is really continue to nurture and uh, build that community of carers. And I believe that many of, or if not all the people in this room are part of that, that each of us then uh, support each other, work with each other, and f in facing in very difficult issues where we will continue to need each other along this very difficult path. Thank you very much, and I'd like to pick that up. Uh, I was told to end very punctually, and I live in Switzerland, and I think I'm going to manage it. Uh, that uh, those two words I think I'd like to pick up, the ambition and the leadership. First of all, to take very seriously the ambition of the SDGs. And uh, it's a unique vision for the world as we want it to be. It has some gaps, we heard that. It has some problems, synergies, coherence, etc. But it's really something we have never, never had before. And we should use it and capitalize with it as much as possible. And we have data and we have measurement possibilities, and we can see where we are moving forward and where we are not. And particularly where we are not, we should show leadership. And leadership is not just, oh, what is Dr. Tedros doing, or uh, what is the head of Pfizer doing, or what is Dr. Moeti or uh, Dr. El Haji Al Si doing, but leadership is every one of us in the context in which we are working. So we really want to encourage you between this World Health Summit and next year's World Health Summit to show this leadership and to report to each other about this leadership when we come back together again next year for the 10th anniversary. Thank you very much to this fantastic panel. Thank you.